Dave Meltzer here with Entrepreneurs the Playbook live at SoFi Stadium, the greatest stadium ever created and the greatest screen right behind me as well. But now I have one of the greatest comedians, actors, producers, philanthropists. The list will go on and on. Everybody knows him, Rob Riggle. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's really exciting for me because I never thought that I'd be sitting here <laughs> and then let alone sitting here with someone like you as well because there's certain people that I just am a fan of. And coming from the sports agency world, I'm not that enamored with the Joe Namus and the <laughs> Joe Montanas because they were work associates. And that's so funny because those are the only guys that make me nervous. Right, exactly. You know, the athletes. Comedians especially make yeah. me nervous. And I find that comedians are some of the most intelligent people on earth. Uh, and they just have an ability to coalesce information and utilize it in a positive way mm -hmm. is the best way I can describe it. And I think if I had a choice of being able to do something, unfortunately, it probably would conflict with my personal family <laughs> time, but I would love to be a comedian. Did you ever think that you would be where you are today? Oh God, no. There's no way you can plan for any of this stuff. You just do and hope it works out. Um, and you don't even know why you're doing it sometimes. You just, <laughs> just know that there's a calling or there's, there's something inside you that says, you got to try it, dude. You got to try it. So that's how, I mean, it, I don't even, you know, I could, I guess if I really sat down and tried to unpack it, yeah. you know, it, it, it could take a, a lot longer than we probably have time for. But uh, for me, it was a, uh, a voice inside my head that said, you got to try it. You got to try it. You got to try it. And if I fail, I can live with that more than the not knowing. Right. Cause I don't know. Failure to me is not failure, you know, it's just a lessons. A, exactly. So, but it's the not knowing it's the waking up when you're 50 and going, I should have done it. I should have done it. And then you're mad at everybody, mostly yourself. So rather than do that, just dive in, take your lumps, see what happens. Do your best, learn lessons and have fun. That's yeah. the way I see Rob Riggle. Yeah. Now, when you were young, you know, I met, uh, Bill Murray owned a home on the golf course that I built in Virginia uh, and like naturally, he was as funny, he's probably the, one of the funniest people I've ever met, just his person, right? Just like being himself. Not, being himself, and yeah. same with Robin Williams, right? Yeah. Extremely funny people. Yeah. Now, when you were a kid, were you the funny guy in the class? I, I was actually voted most humorous in my senior class in <laughs> nice. high school. But I always, I, you know, see the thing was, I, to me, there's two different things. People say, oh, were you the class clown? I was like, no, That's class different. clown was disruptive. You know, he was just the guy back there making fart noises with his armpit, which is funny, <laughs> but still not what I was doing. You know, I thought I was a little more creative. I was on the high school radio station. So and, it, you know, it didn't go out. We weren't broadcasting live over the air. So it was just really pumped down into the cafeteria. Cool. So anybody who stayed in for on lunch. One speaker. Yeah, one speaker. And it was just me. <laughs> but I would do bits, you know, that no no one expected or and, and no one told me to do. I would just do it out of almost boredom. It was like if you. You can do anything you want to me. Just don't bore me because if you bore me, I'm going to self entertain. And that means, you know, like I, we used to get free albums at our high school and they were all garbage. They were garbage, <laughs> but they were free. So you so them. like I remember we got a band called it was back in the hair metal days. This is the 80s. And it was uh, Halloween was the name of this hair metal band. And there was these Dutch pretty boys. Right. That had more makeup than you know, you've ever seen. Right. <laughs> And, and, you know, I would, I would say, Hey guys, you're in luck. You know, we're going to have a Halloween rock block, you know, and everybody in the cafeteria is like, what, who is this? And I, then I put it on and you're in luck because they're on the, you know, they're actually, I've got them on the phone. They're here to talk to us, you know, so hang on. Uh, let me get them right now. And I'd say, hello, uh, is this Halloween? Go, oh, yeah, yeah, here's, here's, you know, and I'd start, and, it, and they were Dutch, but I was doing an English accent, nice. right? And I would interview, do these fake interviews with these guys. And people were like, was that really? I said, no, of course not, you know? And I, I'd give stupid answers and do this. And I was doing it all, you know, basically by myself. And then, again, because I was bored, I would do the old whoops, the microphone's on. So I would leave the master volume up and I'd say, hey, now some more Night Ranger. And I put Night Ranger on, but I leave the microphone up and I go, whew, I'm glad that bullshit's over with. And I'd start cussing into the mic <laughs> and I could hear my teacher, Miss McNamara, come running down the hallway going, the microphone's on, the microphone. <laughs> I did this maybe twice a month 
for an entire year, she never figured it out. Just <laughs> never figured it out. And the students would love it. You know, right. the kids right. were like, Rob's so wow. absent minded. He always forgets to turn uh, the microphone. So, so I thought my bits were a little more clever than just, you know, armpit farts. And they still are a lot more <laughs> clever than that as well. No, one of the things about being an actor, a comedian, or an entrepreneur is rejection. And mm. one of the lessons that I'd love to teach and illuminate from people like you who have probably gotten more rejection than most people on earth. Now I got it because of the way I looked, you got it because of the profession you were in, but the truth is everyone receives rejection and it's a big issue today with kids because I don't think they've been equipped about how rejection works. And we yeah. were when we were young. For you, have you learned any tricks of the trade, any perception of rejection, of how to utilize it? Because you're obviously an optimist like I am, yeah. but I'm sure you've had many times that no has punched you in the face. Oh, <laughs> listen, if you choose a life in the arts, just count on some pain, count on a lot of rejection. And it's hard not to take it personal because you, you're putting yourself out there. You're saying, hey, this is me and this is my offering. And people say, well, it sucks and I don't like your face and I don't like <laughs> you. I don't even like your tone of voice. Something you're not about funny. You. Yeah, I hate you. <laughs> right. And you're like, wait a minute. I, what's my biggest sin? I tried to make you laugh and you hate, you know, like it's, it's absurd, right? And there is no easy answer for it, for what I've discovered, what I've learned, other than a resiliency, fortitude, um, and, and embrace the suck, you know, embrace it a little bit. When I bombed or when I failed or when I was told not you, there was the, uh, always a sense of shame that came along with it, a sense of, oh, and you want to put your head down and shrivel. And that's totally normal. That's the human experience. When someone says, not you, you suck, <laughs> you shrivel. And, and there's a shame. And then there's a self-loathing because, you, you know, the, you have nothing to do but the whole next day to think about how, how much that hurt and, and screw those guys and, and I suck at this. And you, and you beat the tar out of yourself. And it's, it's just part of the experience. Now, if you have it happen enough and you are, have the grit to, to weather that, then the rejections become more uh, 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 where you don't shrivel, you don't shrink. And that resiliency, you actually look at it almost like a third party, almost from a 30,000 foot view. And you say, OK, what what can I take away from that? What what can I learn from that? And instead of I hate myself, I hate myself, I hate this job, I, I hate suck. I suck, I suck. Everybody sucks. I hate this. I'm going to do something else because that's what happens to the bulk of people when they get into the arts. And, in, and business and anything else. I mean, yeah. it's really not limited to the arts, but I see it a lot more in the arts, um, especially on a personal level, a personal not you. Because, you know, in business, they can say not your product. Right. Or it's not right for me. But in arts, it's not you, you know. And so uh, if you can look at it with, uh, with the, uh, the eyes of um, lesson and growth, you know, it's, so it's, it's a mentality. It's a mindset where you look at it differently. And don't allow the shame to wash over you and say, OK, that sucked. I failed. You know, uh, I bombed that night. What did I do wrong? Or what was the elements that led to that? Or how could I have changed it? It's it, you know, there's there's certain gravitational points that that I find in all the stuff that I've read. And because and, I do try to study leadership and growth and all this stuff and and personal responsibility. You know, that's yeah. always a big part of it. So so what could I have done differently? You know, it's not the crowd. They didn't suck. You know, um, it's not the environment. Maybe it is. Maybe the, maybe those are elements of it. Sure. But OK, so I was thrown into a bad situation. How can I what could I have done differently? How, how could I have turned it in from total failure to ah, I was an OK? <laughs> you yeah. know, how could I have pulled a uh, victory from the jaws of defeat? And and so that mindset kind of it. That's when things start to turn for you. I've noticed uh, that's when they started turning for me. Um, and I still, you know, I still go out there some days and, and kill it. And then I go out there some days and it doesn't go the way I want it to go. But I, I own it now a lot more than I did before. It's you so know? important, right? What did I yeah. do? What am I supposed to learn from it? That's yeah. simple, uh, but yet difficult thing to do. Now, one of the things about running backs and comedians that I find, and I talked about Robin Williams, mm -hmm. uh, who obviously now we've found out had a brain disease, but obviously was struggling 
but yet he put on a, a different face because he had this great talent or you know bill murray who i know is just authentically funny yeah <laughs> right yeah um but you know running backs i've dealt with for a long time and they almost hide behind and then you put them on a field mm -hmm. and you know whether it's ricky williams or lt or yeah. it's just an incredible change in personality and i see actors a lot of times be introverted uh, are there parts of your personality that you either project out onto a stage uh, out of some sort of childhood trauma or psychology or is there something you hide from is there any inside nuance of who you are that you have found now that you're over 50 right that gosh you know i tried to be funny because i was masking something yeah, or, or it was a, it was a salve on a wound or yeah, something yeah. no you know i i i'm i'm I don't think that's the case. Yeah. I could be wrong. I haven't, we'll send I haven't, you to therapy. No yeah. <laughs> They'll make one up for you if you want. They'll make you rely more interesting. No, I, I, don't, I don't think that's the case. Yeah. I, I, I don't think I was masking anything. I think it came from joy. It came from a, a love of comedy. Um, and who are your favorite com comedians? Oh, I grew up, I grew up with uh, Bill, Bill Murray. Nice. Uh, as, as far as comedic acting. Yeah. I think he's one of the all-time greats. Uh, Eddie Murphy. Me too. Was one of my absolute favorites, and not only in stand-up, but as an actor as well. Um, uh, yeah, those two, you know, uh, all the comedians, uh, really from the from the '80s and '90s, you know, the ones I grew up watching, I really could, can't get enough. Um, all those classic comedies. Um, and do you like stand-up or acting? Uh, comedic acting comedic is my acting. thing. I've, I've done it all because I think a comedian should do it all. So I, I, I was lucky, you know, I came up doing sketch and improv comedy um, at the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater in New York. And then I uh, did stand up uh, for a while and comedic acting. And I think you have to have all those spokes on the wheel in order to be a well-rounded comedian. You have to experience it and kind of know all of that because uh, they're all different. They're, in my opinion, they're very different. But comedic acting is probably what I enjoy the most. And and. Uh, I, I love putting on a character because most of the characters I play are comedic jerks, <laughs> uh, which I love playing because, you know, you get to take that part of your personality out for a walk, which you never That's should take so out cool. for a walk. Right. Right. right, right. But when you, Especially someone today. says, but when someone says, Hey, license to license to be the biggest douche on earth, <laughs> it's like, Oh, get out of my way. Cause That's, I'm going to just let it roll. That's so and good. then it is joyful. You know, it is fun. Um, and those are a blast. I always, I always savor those characters. So, and content has changed. Uh, we had a conversation earlier and like I said, I never thought I would be here, but content changed where everyone has the opportunity to have an audience or a community and the size, scope and scale of the community that a David Meltzer could have millions of people that tune in every day that are at my frequency. Yeah. And we're both old radio guys, so that frequency is important. Yeah. Um, That's because you, you're saying important stuff. I, but it's important too, to, like people like you that have so much talent, right? I'm new to the content game, yeah. but not new to the business game. So right. I try to keep my content to what I know. I don't try to be Rob Riggle, right? right? I, I, it's good. At, yeah, that's, right? I'm only funny as far as I'm funny, <laughs> but when it comes to business, I know my shit. Yeah. Um, but for someone like you that's been on the big screen, mm -hmm. right? That's recognizable. I'm just you famous, right? I go to a club and they're like, even with my wife, just you, right? There's no posse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One, I'm perfectly famous at a stadium. One person knows me <laughs> and wants to take a picture of me. Perfect. Which is perfect, yeah, right? Yeah. And I know. But for you, these changes happen fast. Where do you see the biggest opportunity for substantial actors like yourself, substantial you know, characters that now have to transition? We're talking about Jim Rome, who probably in the sports world is one of the biggest names who Absolutely. now has to transition. What are some of the things you're looking at in the transition with all these new opportunities beyond yeah. just network and, and movies? You know, I, uh, it goes back to growth to me. Uh, if you're not growing, you're dying. And so I, I always like the idea of what's next. What can I do? You know, what are my skill sets? You know, I'm a, I'm a retired lieutenant colonel in the Marine Corps. I've got a whole wealth of experience in leadership and, and stuff I can bring from there. Uh, I'm I, I insatiable when it comes to reading about personal growth and development. Um, I, I've, I've been fortunate enough to have a, a career in the arts. 
you know, acting and comedy and writing. And uh, so I, I feel like I have this, this wealth of experience. I've, I, I own, you know, uh, a couple businesses and I, and I try to learn as much as I can on that front. That's probably where I'm weakest, you know? So I, so this whole thing and, and you, you take all these lessons and the longer we live, thank God, <laughs> the longer we live, the more we learn, right? And the more we grow and we keep growing and keep learning. And then you learn some lessons over and over and then you got to get beat over the head with a couple lessons until you learn it. And so for me, that growth, you get to a point where you're like, I, I, I used to enter the room and thought everybody was smarter than me in the room. And I just assumed it. And now I don't think that. I don't think I'm the smartest, but I also, I have a little confidence in myself. I believe in myself more. And I'm like, you know, I actually have something to offer in this conversation. I have something that, I have a little wisdom that might be helpful to you or maybe helpful to this person. And, you know, you're, you're a mentor to, to young people. And, and um, I see it with, with, uh, with our young men today, you know, that there is a, there's, it seems to be a problem out there. Yeah. With confidence, with resiliency, um, they, you know, and it, it's not just the, the boys, but it's boys and girls. But I, I personally see it more with the boys. So I'd love to help them. I'd love to, to. And I don't know how necessarily just yet, but I would love to offer them. And young people, this isn't just men, but young people, I'd like to offer them uh, some wisdom. Now, whether they receive it or not, <laughs> that's always the key, right? You don't have to have them receive it. Uh, Dennis Waitley, who's an old sales trainer, okay. wrote many books on sales. Okay. He gave me the best piece of advice about it. He said, David, you're just planting seeds under trees you may never sit under. Yeah. So don't worry if they're hearing you. Yeah. It, you're just planting a seed. And some people, those seeds will sprout really quickly. Mm -hmm. Now you do a lot to give back as well. And I know you have a big event in June yeah. in Kansas City with some extraordinary uh, people, characters yes. as well, to raise money uh, for the hospital there as well. Tell me a little bit about the Big Slick Celebrity Weekend that you put on. Um, well, I, it was it, we started it about 13, 14 years ago. Uh, it was just Paul Rudd, Jason Sudeikis, and myself. And just those guys, Just, right? just the three. <laughs> yeah. But we're all Kansas City guys, you know. And, <laughs> and, <funny>. and, <laughs> and we, we, we love our hometown. Uh, and Children's Mercy Hospital is one of the great children's hospitals in the country. They do amazing research. At their, their oncology department's un, unbelievable. So, uh, so, you know, and they, they don't turn anybody away. So they require a lot of additional funding. So... We just embraced it, and 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 then uh, we invited Eric Stone Street and Dave Keckner, who are also Kansas City guys. I don't know. There must have been something in the water in the <laughs> '80s and '90s back in Kansas City, uh, but there's just a lot of comedic talent back there. And and now we we've added Heidi Gardner, uh, who's on Saturday Night Live, and just a super talent. She's a Kansas City uh, lady. It. And so now it's it'll be uh, it's more than just barbecue. It'll be this, exactly. Or, or just Kansas City. Exactly. <laughs> um, and so we do this event and we, we invite all our celebrity friends to come back to Kansas City and, and spend time at the hospital. We play a little softball game out at uh, Kauffman Stadium out at the K. And, uh, and we, we have a big weekend just raising money for, for the kids. And, and it's been very successful and it's grown almost every year. And we kept it going through the covid time. And um, so anyway, it's just something we're all real proud of. And and. Everybody shows up and, and has the right mindset, and we make a difference. And you make a difference in so many different ways, not just raising money, but you make people's lives better. You make them laugh. You make them smile. Right back at you. And right it's back just at you. amazing. Now, there's a couple of things I got to talk about before I let you go. Number one, yeah. when your Chiefs come here yeah. to play my Chargers, yep. can you tell them, look, I'm okay with you winning. Just not last minute heartbreakers. Yeah, yeah. Just kick our butt. <laughs> like I, I was fine with the Jaguars killing us. I, yeah. We were out of it, and it's just so much easier yeah. than Mahomes. He just loves to give them this hope until the last 13 seconds, or 23 seconds, or 43 seconds. Yeah. Just you know, give Pat a little n nudge. And I can talk to him. I don't know what's going to have any <laughs> result. It's uh, killing me. This is what Elway used to do to the Chiefs. Right. My whole youth. It was always last minute heartbreaking. The it, at the he would time. always shatter us at the end, and it would just be like God. And it would always be—I knew what would happen. I, I mean, it was, I was always committed, uh, resigned myself to it, where I'd be like, you know, we'd be we'd go get the score, go ahead with two minutes left, you know, and I'd be like, well, it doesn't matter. Two minutes is all. Yeah, that's 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 one minute two and thirty seconds longer than he needs. Exactly. <laughs> and sure enough, he'd scramble outside. You know, like we'd even get pressure on him. He'd scramble outside and make something happen. I, 
and they would win. I just would rip my heart out every time. So I, I, I'm sorry that it's been passed on to you. It has. Yeah. It's, but it's okay. Well, there's three things I know about Kansas City now that always known for barbecue. Yes. Always known for great sports fans. Yes incredible sports fan yes. but I didn't know they had the world's best comedians as well I knew they had you <laughs> but I didn't realize the posse yeah. you guys could run a traveling show as we finish up you know I've done a lot of corporate speaking and yeah. as we were talking about leadership personal development um, it's a unique capability that you have now that you are more seasoned in your business experience in your entrepreneurial career your philanthropy I could imagine a better corporate speaker i don't know if you're doing it yet but if you need someone to work with you I'm, yes oh my gosh there's it, coming from an ex-ceo of a major corporation yeah. i couldn't think of and i'm saying this humbly because i get hired all the time <laughs> but i'd rather have rob riggle than dave melcher on a stage because you could teach those lessons and tell stories at a level that most human beings on earth can't and then to add authentic legitimate humor yeah. uh professional acting and humor to yeah. it is a combination that is absolutely de uh, just unbelievably valuable in the corporate world. Is that something that you're looking forward to? Yeah, doing? I think that would be something I would really embrace and, and love to do. Um, you just have to stay away from the, the jerk stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I couldn't go out and be like, what are you all looking at? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you could finish with it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, I think that would be, see, to me, that's an opportunity for growth. That's an opportunity to, oh. to, to try something new and, and, and see, if, there, if I have anything to offer, service is a big part of what we do, right? Absolutely. And so if I have, if, if there's something there and it, and it could help, then I feel like, that, okay, I found a new way to serve. So that's a good thing. Yeah, well, there's been so many great actors that have taken things to the next level. I see you having a top podcast, top book, top speaking, <laughs> and even maybe some mentorship and coaching uh, along the way. The incredible Rob Riggle, thank you for joining me. Thank you. At the home of the Los Angeles Chargers here at SoFi Stadium, <laughs> this is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs, The Playbook.